Hello, this will be the AP Chemistry Notes for pages 19 and 20. So we're starting um, a unit that will be on gases, liquids, and solids, but the majority of the time will be spent on the gas laws. And that's similar to what happens in first year. So a bit of review. First, temperature is usually done in either degrees Celsius or Kelvin. And there's an interesting history behind this. What happened was Anders Celsius came along and came up with a scale for temperature. And he decided to base it on something important. So he based it on water, of course. And he said that he wanted the freezing point of water to be zero and the boiling point to be 100. And then everything else would just fall into place. And that was a good idea and is of course why we still use it is because it's based on such an important thing to us, which is water. The problem with Celsius is that it goes negative. You can go a lot colder than zero degrees Celsius. In fact, it goes all the way down to approximately negative 273 degrees Celsius. And that's not great when we want to do uh, math and comparisons because you end up getting negative numbers that don't make sense. You also have the problem of zero degrees Celsius is a reasonable temperature. It's a little bit cold to us, but it's not that big of a deal. You end up doing calculation using zero degrees and the math just doesn't work. So what Kelvin did was he said, okay, I like your scale, but I want zero to mean zero. In other words, the absence of any heat or energy will be zero and will go only go up for there. And he did an experiment and determined where Celsius would go. And he determined the coldest it would go was approximately this. Of course, there are more digits. It's negative 273.15, something, something, something. And he said, I'm just gonna reset that to be zero. So negative 273 degrees Celsius is the same thing as zero degrees Kelvin. On Kelvin, we usually don't put the little degree circle. Um, there's kind of an interesting history behind that that I'm not gonna get into right now. And so an interesting thing is that if you go to zero degrees Celsius, everything just goes up in Kelvin by 273. So zero degrees Celsius, is of course 273 Kelvin. And so notice as Celsius changes, Kelvin changes the same. It's just that Kelvin is always 273 higher. So for example, if somebody said the temperature of the beaker went up 10 degrees Celsius, it must also go up 10 Kelvin. They move at the same speed. It's just that Kelvin is always this much higher. Now, I think by knowing this background and that the problem with Celsius is that it goes negative and Kelvin doesn't go negative, that will help you remember. I find that students often remember, oh yeah, it's 273, but they can't remember, should I add 273 or should I subtract 273? Well, remember the reason why Kelvin was done. It was to fix the negative problem of Celsius. So that means Kelvin must always be the higher number and Celsius must always be the lower. So if you're going from Celsius to Kelvin, you must add 273. And I find it's better if you can just remember why these things exist as opposed to just memorizing an equation. All right, back here, uh, volume. These are all the same thing. 
a thousand milliliters is a thousand cc, which just stands for cubic centimeters. So that's you've got a centimeter wide, a centimeter tall, and a centimeter deep. If you took that and calculated it, you get the same thing as one milliliter. And you can kind of see this. If you remember the 10 milliliter graduated cylinder in the lab, you might remember that it's about from one milliliter to the next milliliter. So let's just say from the two milliliter to the three milliliter. You might remember it's about one centimeter tall. And it's about, yeah, I know it's a circle, but it's about one centimeter wide and one centimeter deep. And it's roughly similar to this, which will help you remember this scenario. Of course, a thousand milliliters is one liter, and this is just a weird way to write it. In cubic meters, we usually don't do it that way. Uh, the symbol for moles is N, and just think of it as the number of moles, so N as number. Pressure, we're mainly going to focus on atmospheres and these two, tor and millimeters of mercury. You might see PSI or kilopascals. Uh, PSI is more something that you see in daily life, like in tires, like bicycle tires, basketballs, and car tires. Um, KPA stands for kilopascals, and that's usually used in physics. We don't see it too much in chemistry. I do want to talk about Torricelli's experiment and why it leads to such a weird unit. This MMHG, I think, really confuses a lot of people. I'm going to tidy things up here a little. I think it'd be faster if I don't do it that way. Okay. Here, let's get rid of all this. We'll clean this whole page up. Give you a mental break. Okay. On to the experiment. So this guy named Evangelista Torricelli, that's my best Italian, he took a container of mercury. Little did he know that it was probably poisoning at the time. Um, one of the interesting things of mercury is if you were to take a bowl of mercury, it doesn't look like it's evaporating, just like a bowl of water doesn't look like it's evaporating, but it's actually evaporating into the air. Um, we breathe it in unknowingly. It gets in your blood. Eventually it concentrates in your brain and causes you to go uh, a bit crazy. Um, and then ultimately uh, will uh, end your life. And unfortunately, a lot of early people that were doing research using mercury, like Torricelli, probably got very sick um, because of it. But fortunately, we know now you don't mess around with it unless you have controlled environment and um, special safety equipment. But what he did was he took this bowl of mercury and he put a tube into the mercury. The tube was sealed at the top. This tube would have been straighter than mine. He did his best to take all the air out of the tube. So this would be a tube with no air. And no surprise, if you take this tube with no air and you stick it in the bowl of mercury, some of the mercury wiggles its way up. So let's say the mercury was blue, even though it's course, silver. The mercury wiggles its way up the tube, but it doesn't go forever. It keeps going until the force of gravity pulling down on it equals to what's pushing it up. So it goes up to a certain height. 
And what was happening here was that gravity was pushing down. I'll just call it G. And you need to realize what pushed it up. Well, what was pushing it up was the atmosphere. Pressure was pushing on the mercury. The atmosphere is pushing in all directions, including down on the mercury, which caused it to go up the tube. And it would keep going up the tube until the force of gravity equaled it. It turns out that height, no surprise, was that it went up 760 millimeters high. That would have been relative to the surface of the mercury if we imagine the surface of the mercury being in this bowl here. And that's why one atmosphere that we live in, technically at sea level, is the equivalent of pushing mercury up a evacuated tube 760 millimeters, hence 760 millimeters of mercury. You can do the same experiment with other liquids, but they're gonna go much higher. For example, if you use water instead of mercury, you would new, need a tube that would, um, it would need to be almost two stories tall for you to do the same measurement, but it would work and I'm sure it's been done. In honor of Torricelli, they often say it's also 760 Tor. And that's just named after him. So same idea, 760 Tor, 760 millimeters of mercury, are both equal to one atmosphere. And we'll be using all three of those. All right, STP, standard temperature and pressure, it's just a set pressure and a set temperature. One atmosphere, which is normal, and zero degrees Celsius, which is a little cold. Uh, R, you should remember R is 0 0.0821 with these units. Be aware, you will see R in different units. Sometimes the atmosphere, will be changed to millimeters of mercury, or the volume will be changed from liters to milliliters. You usually don't see moles and Kelvin changed. And so if you see a different number here, there's a good chance the units were changed. Next, law of combining volumes is just saying that if you're at constant temperature and pressure, the coefficients in a reaction don't just mean moles. They always mean moles. When you look at a balanced reaction, coefficients always mean moles. That's just the foundation of the reaction. But in this case, if they're gases at constant temperature and pressure, you can also use them to mean liters. So if you take a look at this example here with hydrogen, nitrogen, and ammonia, if you wanna convert between liters of any chemical to any other chemical, or milliliters for that matter, you can do it all in milliliters if you want. You can just do it right that way with stoichiometry and not bother going to moles. So in this case, if we take 5.20 liters of nitrogen here, you can directly convert from nitrogen to hydrogen using the balanced reaction, and you get 15.6 liters of hydrogen that would have been needed to react with that much nitrogen. Now, I wanna talk about this reaction a little bit. As you'll notice on the notes, I wrote learn reaction and discuss it. Well, this reaction is one that you wanna have in your toolbox. So I always prefer that students have kind of a toolbox of reactions that they've learned. This is arguably number one for many reasons. So it's an important reaction currently because this is how we make ammonia, one of the main ways we make ammonia, which is used in fertilizers, which of course helps grow all the crops to feed the world's population. The story about a guy named Fritz Haber, I'll do the short version here. Um, he was a German citizen, and in World War I, he basically made this reaction useful. The reaction was known, 
but it wasn't very useful because of equilibrium. It didn't go, like to go forward, it preferred to go backwards. And if your goal is to make ammonia, you don't want it to go backwards. Well, he was able to make this work in a significant way to make a lot of ammonia, which in this time in World War I was used to make weapons and bombs. And fortunately, it has a happier ending in that now today, we don't use it to make bombs and weapons, we use it to make fertilizers and so on. That's the short version. Maybe I'll get into the longer version in another lesson. Or maybe you may even make a lesson just about that. But I want you to memorize this reaction. Just know this one. Just know hydrogen reacts with nitrogen to make ammonia. And of course you can balance it if needed. It's also good to remember that it is a reaction that establishes equilibrium. And so you will often see this used as examples in equilibrium and on questions and exams that have anything to do with equilibrium. It's a really good example. Moving along. Um, for the gas laws. Dalton's law, a lot of people see Dalton's law and they say, oh, that's just common sense add up the individual pressures to get the total pressure. It basically it's saying is just add up the pieces to get the total. And that it is kind of obvious, but at the same time, he's given credit because he figured this out and proved it. And of course, proving these things with gases is very complicated, especially years ago. Um, it's very useful when you are collecting a gas over water. And so what you'll see is a problem that says something like oxygen was collected over water, dot, dot, dot. And then the problem goes on to talk about other things. And what you need to know, if you wanna focus on just the pressure of the oxygen, you have to take this water vapor that's gonna be in there because of course there will be a little bit of water vapor that is contaminating your oxygen and subtract that because otherwise you'll be dealing with the total pressure which is the oxygen and the water and we'll look at problems like that in the future next one combined gas law it combines three laws Boyle's Charles I think it's spelled like this and Guy Lussac's, and I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. Those are three different laws, and if you combine them, you get this. Now, normally when you see it, you don't see it in this form. You normally see P1V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2, and that should look familiar, should look like what you did in first year chemistry. Technically, you're supposed to add moles in there. And the only reason we don't bother with that in first year chemistry is because we're assuming that moles are equal. So you don't need it. But you can also put it in there. And I put a note here, they both equal R. If you take PV equals NRT, which of course we'll talk about in a minute. If you solve for R, you'll get that R is PV over NT, and notice that's what we have here. PV over NT equals PV over NT. Showing that R in, is indeed a constant. I mentioned, make sure your units match. It doesn't matter what your pressure unit is, and it doesn't matter what your volume unit is, as long as they match. You do want your temperature in Kelvin because otherwise you'll have that problem with Celsius of negative numbers and zeros and the ratio will just be off. Of course, I just mentioned the ideal gas law. This is the major equation of this unit. Anytime you're doing a problem and you see something that mentions a volume and a pressure and a temperature and so on, you should just automatically start thinking ideal gas law. Now the whole ideal concept 
that just assumes that the particles almost are behaving independently of each other. They're bouncing around in the container, but they're not really being attracted or repelled and they're not taking up any space. And that's the whole ideal concept. Of course, real gases that exist in the real world aren't ideal, but they're close enough that we can start with the ideal gas law. And we'll talk about later what to do if you really wanna get down to the truth. Um, there's a modification of the ideal gas law. If you combine the ideal gas law and density, which of course is mass over volume, and molar mass, which is grams per mole. If you take these three things and you kind of manipulate them all together, you can get this version here, which is useful when dealing with the density of gases in which we have pressure, molar mass over RT, and just be aware the units are grams per liter, not milliliter, because grams is in molar mass and R has liters in it, usually. All right, this right here is just showing, this is something we don't usually have to deal with, but you can kind of combine Dalton's law, which is here. And then instead of plugging in pressure of gas A and pressure of gas B, pressure of gas C and so on, you can then replace them with their equivalent using the ideal gas law, which is here and here. And by the way, these individual pressures are called partial pressures because they're part of the whole. Now, a mole fraction, this is new. A mole fraction is exactly what it says it is. It is a fraction using moles. The symbol is a big X. And like I wrote here, what you do is you put the moles of what you're interested in, in this case, gas A, and you divide by the total moles. That's the mole fraction. Now the X is the symbol. The actual mole fraction doesn't really have units because moles and moles will cancel, like I have here. But sometimes you might see it written out so in my case, you might see moles of A over moles total because they're both moles, but they're not moles of the exact same thing. So you might actually see units with it. And where this is useful right now is if you multiply the mole fraction of a gas times the total pressure, p tot, you get the pressure of that particular gas or its partial pressure. And so let's take a look at an example. Contents of a tank of natural gas at 1.20 atmospheres is analyzed by an unfortunate worker at the Your Loss is Our Gain human waste processing facility. So the history of my little quote there was I was driving on the freeway, 405 freeway, I think going to school, and I uh, was driving by um, a big tanker truck that I assume cleaned porta potties. And on the back of the truck, it said, your loss is our gain. And that just, that stuck with me. I thought it was funny. Anyway, let's say this person analyzes some gas coming off of this. And for simplicity, we're gonna narrow it down to just two gases, uh, methane CH4 and propane C3H8. Um, this problem was a little vague. It says the analysis showed 82.6% and 17.4%. It really would have been better if the problem had said what the percents were based on. Were they based on mass or volume or pressure and so on? So in this case, I've added that it's by mass. But if it doesn't say, usually you can assume it's by mass, but hopefully it does. I wanna know what is the partial pressure exerted by each gas? In other words, how much of this 1.20 atmospheres is from the CH4 and how much is from the C3H8? And an easy way to do this is to use this scenario here. 
So since it's a percentage, and now we know it's by mass, we'll assume 100 grams, and I'll rewrite my percents as grams of methane, grams of propane. Turn them to moles by dividing by molar mass, which I've done. So I have 5.15 moles of methane, 0.394 moles of propane. Add them together to get in total. That's 5.544 moles total. It'd actually be helpful to write that right here. I find when students write things like 5.544 moles and they don't give any details about it, you can get lost in the problem really easily. So it's best to write moles total. So now we use this equation that I have in 2B, the pressure of the methane, CH4, is the mole of methane divided by the total mole times the total pressure, and you get this. Pressure of the propane is its mole, 0.394 divided by the total times the total pressure, and you get this. And of course, if you wanna do a little check at the end, if you add those up, you should get about 1.20 atmospheres. The last thing for right now <clears throat> is the water vapor pressure chart. I want to see the whole chart at once, so let's shrink this down a little. What this shows, and there's actually a lot in this chart, <clears throat> is based on temperature, how much pressure is the water vapor contributing? So notice, as the water gets hotter, as we go down the chart in temperature, more water vaporizes and it creates more pressure. So if we start at, let's say, room temperature. Room temperature would be right about here, eh, depending on how you like it. I like the room a little cold, so I'm going to go with 22. That's enough heat for the water in a container or if you had a open bowl of water to create this pressure, 19.8 tor or 19.8 millimeters of mercury, which isn't much. And that makes sense. The water's not very hot. Now, if you heat the water up to the point where you start to see steam coming off of it, that'd probably happen probably around 80 or 90. Because the water has so much more energy, it really vaporizes, and notice how the water vapor pressure goes up a lot. There's a few other interesting things in here. Notice at zero degrees Celsius, the water vapor pressure is not zero. It's 4.6, which is incredibly low, but even at zero degrees Celsius, a little bit of vapor is escaping. In fact, you can even go negative. If you go down to negative one degree Celsius, I don't know the value, but there would be some small value of pressure from the water vapor coming off of it, less than 4.6. Um, because even if you have an ice cube and you set an ice cube out, some of the water molecules can escape. Probably the most interesting area is when you get to 100 degrees Celsius. Now we're assuming that we're at normal pressure, so we're at one atmosphere, but in this situation, you know the 100 degrees Celsius as the boiling point of water, and here's why that's the case. What happens, is when the water reaches 100 degrees Celsius, its vapor pressure is now able to compete with the atmosphere. So if we imagine we have a pot of water, we got our water in here, before you reach 100 degrees Celsius, the water vapor that's coming off of here is creating some amount of pressure. 
and this would be the water vapor pressure. But if you're less than the boiling point, so let's say we're at 90 degrees, the atmosphere is pushing down on the water with higher pressure. So let's just say we're at 90. So at 90, the water vapor pressure would be 526 torr, I'll just round. And the atmospheric pressure is going to be what the atmosphere normally is, which would be 760 torr. And that's why it's not boiling. The atmosphere is winning. Some of the water vapor is still escaping but you're not getting those bubbles yet. It's not until you get that water hot enough that it can compete with the atmosphere. So now if you raise the temperature of the water vapor to something higher, let's say 100 degrees, well now the actual vapor coming off of the water is pushing back on the atmosphere with the same pressure and that's why you start to then get the bubbles. <laughs> so hopefully that can help you understand why boiling occurs the way it does. And that should do it for this lesson. <laughs>